sorry guys, you're gonna have to excuse me. I'm just lit up from the bloodbath that me and Laura had yesterday in the garage. We did so many deads, good mornings, RDLs. We rigged up the Nordic Hyper with the Speedians Gym Monster to do constant speed isokinetic nonsense. And we feel like we got caught counting cards and got tuned up in the back of a casino. So if I'm fidgety, if I look uncomfortable, it's because I'm on week two of 70s Power Lifter. The thing is, that's not even the shitty week. Those of you that have ran it know, it's week three. Everything's like five sets of 10 across. We're going to make it through. I don't know if we're going to be in one piece, but we're going to make it through. And of course, I am using base strength AI because what the hell else would I be using? Now, speaking of shameless product placement, I'm also wearing the white barbell apparel shirt because it contrasts nicely with the red patches on my skin. Why do I have red patches on my skin? Because I'm a California born ginger who decided to move to Texas in his late 30s. Just like if I took a trip to Tijuana, I would probably get Montezuma's revenge. This is like Santa Ana's revenge. This is the angry spirits of the past and get the hell out. And speaking of weird skin side effects, we're going to talk about Trenbolone today. We are going to cover this piece I've been wanting to react to for a while, Dr. Chris Raynor. What the hell is Tren? Uh, this guy's an ortho and he gives his medical expert take on a whole host of things, including weightlifting stuff and hormonal stuff and steroid stuff. So it's very interesting, but I've been very open about my use in the past. I think it's very important to foster an honest discussion because there's all kinds of mythology that permeates on both sides. And I'm going to give my experience from talking to other people, things that I experienced on it. So to save you the suspense, Trend is a hell of a drug. I hate Trend. It works extraordinarily well, but more so than most of the other drugs, it has a list of very obvious, very immediate effects. And looking back on it, I think Trend actually cost me a lot of years of gains and I'm going to get into that. Let's get started. Trenbolone, the monster steroid. Of all the steroids you could abuse, Tren is the one you want to stay away from the most. You have a regular car, you put in a bigger engine, more horsepower. The problem is the vehicle is not meant to handle that much power. I'm talking about Tren super liberally, like it's just, it's cool, it's Tren. You know, it's the crack. Yeah. It's the crack of steroids. Bro. It's got an image of Dave Chappelle with like the beanie on and like white powder all over his face, like scratch himself. Like you got any Tren man, I'll suck your dick. That analogy is kind of apt because like I was thinking the other day about the types of dirt bags that uh, frequented the gym and would talk openly about steroids like when I ran my gym and, and when I was competing a lot more heavily and you get very much a culture of people like younger people or people that don't quite have their life set up. So you get a lot of broke dudes who might have double digits in their bank account, but they're still trying to spend money on like bathtub gear and jugs away protein and frivolous gym equipment. And it's funny, like you have a drug called Primo, which is known to work very well, but it's known for being expensive. The cost isn't even comparable to like all of the other things that you dump money into that are of no value to you. It doesn't even add up to like what your food costs in a month. But that's like that very broke dude mentality where you're like, fuck that, man. I'll go with the trend. Trend works well. It's dirt cheap. So it is. It's like the crack of steroids. It's available to all the bottom rung of society and they get hooked, man. And whatever income they get, Ooh, it's gonna go right into the bathtub Trembolone. What the hell is Trend and why is everybody taking it? The ultimate steroid, the one that's gonna get you bigger than ever. But the thing is people don't realize how dangerous it is to use. Today we're talking about the controversial steroid commonly known as Trembolone. Trent, Trent Ace, or the bootleg version, Trenamol. This performance enhancing drug, or PED for short, is increasingly gaining in popularity in the bodybuilding industry because of its dramatic effects. We're gonna discuss what it is, why it's so popular, and the potential side effects. So prepare for some heavy lifting, some brain building, cause we're learning today. First, let's take a quick look at steroids in general. Many bodybuilders consider them almost a necessity for any title competition. To go pro, it's a must. And at this point, people are relatively open about their usage compared to a few decades ago. There are many well-known bodybuilders that have admitted to taking steroids, such as Ronnie Coleman and Darian Yates. pre 150 milligrams of Trembolone. While others may or may not be taking them. This gives a little hint at his proximity to the culture, which it's relevant how much direct experience he has. But he did say a lot of things that are absolutely correct, like the fact that the culture's changed. You can talk about it openly now. Uh, even, let's say, 15 years ago, as social media started to pick up, you would have people that would push the limits and get attention by crossing the line, violating that taboo. You get like the Boston Lloyds of the world, but even they were kind of stigmatized. But I remember, this isn't even like 10 years ago, maybe eight, 10 years ago, I followed Paul Carter and Mike Isertel on Facebook, so it might as well have been last century. And Paul, before he got on TikTok and started yelling at and being condescending to teenagers, uh, he would post all of his angry coach memery 
onto Facebook. And I think he was getting ready for his first bodybuilding show before he was like all in on hypertrophy. And he turned into such a prick during that time. He had to issue a public apology afterwards. But in getting into an argument with Mike Isretel over like exogenous ketones or something, uh, Paul was like a big pusher of them and he took it personally and they got into this vicious argument. And I remember steroids got brought up at some point and Mike, and I could just see him typing. It was very like proper uh, Isretel, you know, super strict technique cyborg way was like, are you accusing me of taking illegal, illicit compounds? I would advise against that. And now, Isertel's on Table Talk, and even on his channel, he has the most to lose, but he can talk openly, candidly about it. The downside of that is you get fuckery like the Trend Twins, and you do get this pressure for teenagers to see it as normal, something to laugh at. It's, it's this counterculture thing you can do to go on steroids, and it's like what punk rock was in the 80s. I don't know. Um, and that's a different discussion for a different day, but the culture is absolutely changed. But given some of their massive forms, it seems like it's a possibility, if not a probability. The monster-like physique that we are seeing more often nowadays may have to do with an increase in the availability of steroids or an upgrade in their chemistry, the effectiveness of the drugs themselves, or it may have to do with other factors. One theory proposed is that the genetically blessed are seeing financial opportunities and clout that the modern bodybuilding industry provides and are flocking to it, whereas before it was more about the sport. So it's not... Yeah, a lot of people sleep on the impact of the talent pool increasing in putting out that big documentary where I chronicled the training styles that originated in the 1800s and then went up through Sandow and Silver and Golden Era and then as Olympic lifting split off and bodybuilding became its own thing. There's a lot in that history that goes over a lot of people's heads where they see the evolution of size and they're just like drugs. It's just more pharmaceuticals. They're not wrong. I mean, the pharmaceutical component has absolutely grown. But steroids were not really available until the 50s. They weren't really used for this capacity. And they weren't really mainstream, arguably, until D-Ball was created. People will argue with that, trying to say that people in the early 1900s took steroids because of like cow testicles, and those people are idiots. But what people miss is that the number of people who had access to a gym, let alone who actually went to the gym on a regular basis, between like early mid-century in the 1900s and now has increased by a factor of like 10,000. And every time there's a cultural shift that pushes people there, you get this new surge of talent that just didn't exist before. So we had talent in the golden era. Arnold was a talent, but Arnold was not the fringe of fringe talent. In the 70s, it wasn't lucrative to be a bodybuilder unless you were literally the best bodybuilder. It was something that was purely recreational and it was something that if you could be good, might at the very end of the rainbow have uh, some incentive for you to cash in on. Today, if you have a social media account and you're kind of jacked, if you spend enough time on Instagram, you can monetize that. And that's attracted more people to hyper-focus on their physique. So the bar keeps shifting forward. Not necessarily that the physiques are growing per se, but just possibly that we are seeing more huge guys coming out of the woodwork. Another theory is that actual training methods have shifted. People's focuses have shifted from more reps, more gym time, less weight, less rest, to less reps, less gym time, more weight, more rest. Basically cramming more intensity into a shorter workout. Still, yeah, I don't know that I really buy that. There's just such a variety of training that works and that is present and has been present since the beginning. Powerlifting was created in the 60s and it was made out of guys who were just in the gym before doing typical shit because bodybuilding was like the competitive face of gym culture at the time. So it was married for a long time, but across the board, you see different methodologies. I wouldn't say at all that the biggest physiques bias towards that protocol or that there's any clear indication that that guys are going heavier, spending less time in the gym and then getting bigger. In the attempt to get ripped, many bodybuilders will push themselves to the extreme in terms of the actual amount of weight they're lifting to the point some would consider overtraining. So these performance enhancing drugs help the modern bodybuilder go beyond just big. As explained in an article written by journalists Bonnie Berkowitz and William Neff for the Washington Post, the classic look was a wide back with a narrow waist. No part disproportionately large or small. Skin appeared almost shrink wrapped over muscles, as if carved by a sculptor. And some judges may still like that look in some natural shows that drug test competitors or certain divisions of bodybuilding shows. However, the mass monster that's been on the scene since the 1990s has been wowing the crowds in the open categories. This is where the hugest of the huge compete. And as Brad Schoenfeld, a professor at Lehman College in New York and author of several books on bodybuilding and muscle growth puts it, when people go to the zoo, they wanna see lions and tigers. He said, not 
cats and dogs. That's facts, man. But you add in on to that, the culture of lifting, which the competitive aspect isn't like other sports. It's consumer driven. So the money is made by entry fees of all the countless hundreds of thousands of competitors. That's how the money's made. So where the NFL doesn't give a shit what the NFL player wants in the sport, they care about advertising dollars. Powerlifting and bodybuilding care immensely about what the competitors think, which is why they bias towards giving each one their own division. And that's what we have. So you have the Chris Bumsteads in his own division now looking more like that classical ideal, but then people still want to see the freaks. Powerlifting did the same thing with uh, the face of powerlifting throughout like the 90s and 2000s being being like super dug down into the multiply trend where the face of powerlifting back then was the bloated, fat, diabetic, like blood looking like motor oil, sweating sugar and salt, um, fat, bald guy stuffed into Kevlar suits like that was a face because people wanted to see the freak show. But sport always has the spirit of the sport added into it so there's always this friction it would be interesting to see what these sports look like if they were strictly beholden to what could sell in terms of advertising dollars like every other sport on the planet but as the saying goes the problems with powerlifting is that it's filled with powerlifters and i think bodybuilding is probably the same Tren, or trenbolone, is a highly effective synthetic anabolic steroid derived from nandrolone by making specific modifications to its chemical structure. Often referred to as a designer steroid, meaning a synthetic compound that is structurally similar to natural hormones like testosterone, but has been modified to enhance their anabolic effects while reducing androgenic effects. Androgen, meaning masculinizing, as in it promotes the development of male secondary sexual characteristics and anabolic, meaning muscle building. So Tren helps stimulate substantial muscle growth and protein synthesis in the body by binding to androgen receptors. And the results, increase in performance and physique. However, Tren Balone wasn't ever and still isn't actually on the market. So technically it's illegal, but that's not unique to Tren. All steroids are illegal for use without a valid prescription or for general distribution. Steroids are scheduled Unless free you're in the UK. under the Controlled Substances Act. So how are people getting it and what is it officially used for? You can go into any single gym and buy steroids within five minutes of being in there. That's nuts, man. They're very, very available. Tren Balone was first in that is a true story. Um, they are super easy to get and they've been like decriminalized because I don't know anybody who's gotten busted except for guys that were dealing where they would buy an insane amount. The last guy I knew who was like one of the bigger dealers, he had a supplement shop uh, where I lived in California, he ended up getting busted, but it was literally like the cops showed up at his house for some other domestic dispute and he had like hundreds of vials laid out on his table and that's what got him busted. I've never heard of anybody getting busted in any other capacity. They are stupidly easy to get, which is also why you can kind of safely assume that the number of people using them is very, very high, probably much higher than most people are inclined to think. The size in 1963 and was originally classified as a veterinary androgenic anabolic steroid, or AAS, and actually used in the agricultural industry to bulk up cattle and other livestock for slaughter. That cattle it drugs, baby. And muscle growth, making the cows extra beefy, bro. Which for the farmers is great for them. And then you're using some drug for cows at dosages higher than the cows use. <laughs> there are two forms that it can be administered. Finaject, an intramuscular injection, and Finaplex, or pellets. Like you're not a cow. In the 80s, a uh, yeah, brother. company developed a form of <laughs> Imagine you're on an airplane and you're going down, right? And you crash in the Alps. It's like one of those movies where like the soccer team has to survive. Or it's like yellow jackets. And eventually they have to eat somebody to survive. And I'm, you're sitting next to like a big boy from Strength Cartel. Somebody who's just bloated and beefy like cattle and saturated with trend. Something goes through your head where you're like, maybe I shouldn't eat that meat. Like, maybe it's perfectly ethical. He died naturally. It's just protein that's sitting there. You and everybody else is starving, and, you know, nature has to take its course. But you're like, I don't know what that meat is going to do to me. On a serious note, the whole hormones and meat thing is ridiculous because you can't eat hormones and have it end up in your bloodstream. That's why oral steroids have to be created in a lab setting to get that effect. But still, there's something about these aggressive drugs being pumped in. Even as a guy who like doesn't buy into that shit, it still kind of gives you the heebie-jeebies. Trend for human consumption. Parabolin or Trenbolone. Hexahydrobenzyl carbonate, if 
you want to be fancy with it. The drug was meant for treating muscle wasting conditions, malnutrition, and osteoporosis. This was brought to market, though never in the international market, and has since been taken off the market even in France. In the decades that followed, maybe inspired by what they saw on the farm, bodybuilders started using these trend variations for performance enhancement. To this day, usage has dramatically increased, though it is hard to get exact figures because of the fact that many do not admit to using it openly. According to the book, Doping in Sport and Fitness, the increase in its usage may actually be because of the increase in availability of raw powders from underground steroid labs, including those from China. In the 80s and 90s, there's no underground steroids. There is none. It's all pharmaceutical and you can get it. These raw materials make it easier for illicit manufacturers to produce Trenbolone and distribute it on the black market. Well, one thing's for sure. However people are getting it, they are getting it and using it. A lot of these Trenbolone variations bodybuilders are using are modified versions of Trenbolone itself. So the methods I'm aware of, apparently you can get raws from China super easily. They send you the powders and that's what the bathtub chemists are, where it's not that difficult to put together at home and that's how guys will like get and manufacture their own stuff and then mark it up and then you have to worry about things like contamination people get widespread infections because the meathead that figured out how to mix a couple things and put it in a vial and do like basic math wasn't really that concerned with being uh sanitary or they put like benzyl alcohol in it to sterilize it and they put too much and then you get this big rash because your skin's irritated to hell now as easy as it is to get from overseas and it is very easy to get it online it's not even like some dark web shit like it's easy to get i think the reason that people go this route is because uh one it's cheaper so if you start with the raws build it up from scratch your markup is just huge and the further you are down the chain the more screwed you're getting and when you don't know anything when you're young and you think you're gonna get your hands on steroids it's like only 200 bucks for a vial like yeah take my lunch money when in reality the shit costs a guy like five to ten bucks to put together and the first person in line to buy it spends like 30, 35 bucks on it, but then you end up just getting these insane markups. But if you buy a bunch of stuff online, first of all, there's a chance it gets stopped at customs. And if you got a big order, that sucks. And second of all, the markup isn't gonna be quite as high. So that's why the bathtub shit persists, even though it's still super easy to get uh, something that is legit. Again, I don't recommend anybody take this shit, but if, you, if, like, if you're gonna take a drug that your mom doesn't want you to take, at least take a drug that's not going to fucking kill you, give you an infection, be laced with goddamn fentanyl. Like in 2024, there's no reason not to be a big boy and order something that's actually put together well so you're not going to get an infection because it was mixed haphazardly by Cletus, the bodybuilding wannabe who's 33% body fat and has a room temperature IQ, who goes to the gym and wears sweatpants and atomic shoes while he does his Ronnie Coleman tribute workouts. And he figured out how to mix two ingredients together. So now he's a fucking entrepreneur he's a local gym hero selling 17 year olds all the shit just imagine you're going to surgery or to give blood and that's the guy who comes in with the needle you don't want sweat stains on your needles bro that's who you're injecting from so word of advice you don't get homebrewed shit no matter how cool you think it is that it's 30 dollars cheaper trend is not for the faint of heart literally and figuratively because it can have serious effects on the heart which i will cover soon trend is not for first time steroid users and even for the regular trend taker the real trend men. The maximum recommended exposure is around eight weeks to minimize the risk of negative side effects and allow for the body to recover from the steroid cycle. This is like the least thing you want to abuse. Of all the steroids you could abuse, trend is the one you want to stay away from the most. Yeah, and I agree with that. The wisdom I had always gotten was to limit your run, but you still see people that are hell bent on getting that plastic trophy. I knew a guy who may or may not have set an IPF record who told me over sushi, after popping into my gym that he runs trend at a medium to high dose year round. And the guy's like still around kind of clinging to his uh, relevance. And you start to see the effects in somebody who is just kind of big, but their body composition sucks. They don't look healthy. They sweat at the drop of a hat. It probably affects intelligence and IQ. I mean, the aggressive effect it has on your brain when you're on it. Like it is something that even the idiots would recommend like, yeah, don't go too high. Don't run it too long. Like it's something that can fuck you up. Even if you tolerate the side, you think like, oh, it's not that bad. It's the hidden effects that you don't see that a decade down the line where you're like, bro, was that really worth it? Like how close could I have gotten to those results and not had difficulty breathing the entire time and like homicidal ideation and violent sweats during the night like could i have existed like a man and still gotten a good physique and, and a respectable amount of strength yeah fucking probably 100 milligrams for beginners and 300 to 500 milligrams per week for the advanced user however some builders reach up to 800 milligrams per week though 
I knew a strong man that was known for being a deadlift specialist out of the UK who copped to using two grams per week at one point in searching for his new deadlift record. We were having a discussion about sides that I was talking during the time that I took it, like, like how it fucked me up. I compared it. It's why I use that every now and then in my videos. You see the tar monster from Fern Gully that was uh, voiced by Tim Curry. That's what I think of. And that's where that discussion started, where I was talking about like how it hits me. Like you feel like there's something not quite right. The dark side take it over. And this guy's like, man, I took like two grams, bro. I don't feel anything. It doesn't give everybody the same sides, but it also shows how stupid people are willing to be if they think they can get uh, closer to their uh, imaginary dreams of being a local lifting celebrity. Risking serious side effects, which we will also discuss shortly. Trend is becoming increasingly popular for a few reasons. One of which is how it enhances protein sparing. Protein sparing refers to the processes by which the body preserves its muscle tissue during periods of calorie restriction or intense physical activity. This affects why it seems the gains just keep on coming. There's a difference between accrual and like degradation of lean muscle tissue. So trend works by boosting muscle growth or accrual and slowing down muscle breakdown, degradation. This means it helps muscles stay strong and grow even when you're not eating a lot or working out really hard. Which so that was the biggest advantage I saw as a weight class competitor. I, I'll be honest, my diet has sucked the entire time. Even when I was natty, even when I really wasn't using a lot of gear, uh, I rolled around high 20s, maybe 30% body fat, and I would have to cut 25 pounds to get into the 231s, when if I ate like a responsible human being, I wouldn't have had that issue. But trend was one of the biggest edges I got there because I could go into a deep caloric restriction because I'm an idiot when it comes to dieting and I couldn't actually eat like a bodybuilder, which is how you should eat in that situation to spare muscle tissue and get the body fat off. So I would just take my calories down to like 1800 and do cardio throughout the week and get through my sessions. And within three or four weeks, I'd be down like 10, 12 pounds of body fat and I wouldn't have lost any strength. That's something you absolutely can't do. You have to be very careful with your deficits and very calculated with how much protein you're getting if you want to do it right. That's something I recently started taking seriously as I'm edging back into competition. That's one of the biggest impacts is stuff like this is it can give you a big margin for doing stupid shit. I had my 15 years of training where I was educated before I ever touched a drug. But when you find people who within their first year started using and then 10 years later, they're actually strong enough to be competitive, you see some talented people who probably would have been good anyways, but who also are on the drugs and you get a lot of stupid shit. It's why you don't look to the best guys uh, just because they perform well to be sources of information because many of them, a lot of them, and a, an alarming amount of them don't know their ass from a hole in the ground and get away with a lot of bad training decisions and they don't get why what works for them probably isn't going to work for somebody else. It's also why you don't look to somebody based on their results. You look at coaches because what one person does doesn't matter. It's what a whole population of people responds to that gives you an insight of what tends to be true. Now, I believe, I got to double check this, but I believe Trembolone blocks cortisol. And I remember the first time I took it without changing my diet, I was eating like an asshole and my waistline came in. You know those, if, I, if you ever see me post shirtless, that jello that hangs around my, my abs on my love handles, the back fat that Liver King was going broke trying to get rid of, that stuff sucked in so damn quick. And I was eating like a prick. And I believe that has to do with the blocking of cortisol. And I also believe that's related to inflammation. And it's one of the reasons why I went off gear for a couple of years. It's one of the reasons why I'm healthier now than I've ever been and why I'm never going back to the dumb shit that I did before is because the inflammation got so bad from drugs like that that I thought I wasn't going to be able to lift anymore. I thought it was like squat university shit. Well, you know, I'm getting millimeters of hip shift and I'm getting these overuse issues. So I got to go do mobility and round myself out. Really, it was the drugs I was using made me so predisposed to inflammation that my tendons just weren't recovering. I had sprained my patellar tendons. Four years later, I still had extreme pain. That's been gone since I got off. I had uh, IT band pain. I had greater trochantic pain. It's like this vague, non-specific type of pain that kept me from squatting with any amount of aggressiveness for six years. That's gone. But that was, I believe, related to, to the aggressive weight loss and also diminished returns set in. So you'll notice that no matter what down the line, you never get those returns again unless you just start jacking up the dose, which is another uh, ugly effect that leads to dependency here. But it also goes to show that there's more to it than just take drug, get big. There are 
real trade-offs. And in my case, I think those trade-offs actually limited me more than they helped me. And though there seem to be many pros to using Tran over other steroids, it is not without side effects of its own. Let me Preach. start first with the often overlooked side effects, the estrogen-related ones. And what's more terrifying to a man than not being manly? While trenbolone doesn't directly convert to estrogen, its interaction with the progesterone receptor can still result in some estrogen-like effects. It doesn't convert. It can't convert. Well, it doesn't have to convert because there's a mix on these receptors. This can include male breast enlargement, AKA gynecomastia, and men will lactate. Men will absolutely pour out and lactate because of this drug. It can also increase water retention, though many like Trend because in their experience, it did not cause this. It actually allowed them to get that no bloat, chisel look. When people talk about keepable gains, that's one of the things you have to keep in mind is to what degree is whatever size you gain due to actual muscle tissue or is it you just turning into a fucking water balloon? Some people's favorite drugs are really just filthy designer uh, oral steroids that are toxic. They make you lethargic, make you feel like shit. God help you if you drink too much one night, you're going to be sick on the couch the next day. You're going to have to look out for jaundice, but people like them because they're convenient. I can just take an oral cycle before my meat. Uh, it's super convenient, but it's also like the worst of all possible worlds. But a lot of them, D-ball specifically, uh, Anadrol, a lot of the ones that people like because you get real big real fast. There's no way you gain muscle tissue that fast. A lot of it's just blow. It's water tissue. Your face blows up. The muscles just swell immediately. And that's also why when you go off, you lose like 15, 20 pounds pretty quick because your body just isn't holding on to the water. While these estrogen-like side effects are uncommon, it's essential to remember that individual responses to steroids can vary. No, I'm not anxious and bloated. I'm my nipples hurt. In terms of the androgenic characteristics, the masculine related side effects, trend can cause oily skin, acne breakouts, seborrheic dermatitis, which is a skin condition that causes redness, itching, and flaking, and overgrowth of facial hair. That's not what this is, guys. <laughs> from a scalp. The trend stand, trend skin. Mm -hmm. Trend, trend look, skin, yeah. The trend, trend look. Other sex related side effects have to do with our reproductive system and apply to most synthetic steroids. Hypogonadism, the reduced or absent function of the gonads. You know, shrinkage of the coconuts. As a general principle, anytime you take a hormone, you turn off your natural production of that hormone. When the brain is flooded with new hormones, it alerts the hormone managers, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, that the body has too much testosterone. Too much, bro. It suppresses the produced testosterone messages typically sent to the reproductive organs. And within hours, the male system stops doing so. So going on steroids made my dick smaller, but now that my TRT is big again. Sperm production declines within days or weeks, usually hitting zero within a few months. And the testicles shrink by 25 to 35%. Pretty sure Larry was joking there. Steroids don't shrink your dick. If anything, the joke is it makes you look bigger because your balls are smaller. Let that be a lesson, guys tree always looks taller in a desert than a forest. But as far as the shrinkage goes, Trent is known for extreme shrinkage. Like you're like, did they disappear? Like you can't feel them in like the folds of the skin. It's almost alarming at first. Like you'll notice a little bit on, on tests and other stuff, but with Trent, it's like, holy shit, are they ever gonna come back? Trent also causes hypersexuality in men. As explained by our friend Metabolic Doc, it gets into the central nervous system, the limbic area, the area that makes a man sexual. Coming off from this drug is debilitating. I have men suicidal. I'm not recovering. My sex won't come back. However, because of the hypogonadism, it can also cause erectile dysfunction, like any other AAS. And this can even last beyond discontinuation of the drug. Oh, God. There's a difference between someone's desire mm -hmm. to perform and then there's a difference between someone's low performance. It's the difference between I can and I want to. So on the one hand, you're horny, but if you can't get hard, then so it's time to practice a little vulnerability. Uh, my experience with this, you might've heard something called trend dick, which refers to that, the aggressive hypersexualization. Um, uh, it's not just what's going on with your dick it's your brain it's the way you see things to me it felt like getting some brain upgrade like you might give to a soldier in a far-off future to make them go aggro and just be a lot more fucking caveman like it's not just aggression it's like the way you conceptualize opportunities for violence it's the way you conceptualize opportunities for mating or even not mating just immediate sexual gratification i mean i had friends who were disturbed i had a guy come to me he was disturbed by what his porn search history was turning into because of the trend cycle and then in addition to that difficulty being able to perform is something i experienced being horny all the time but especially with the lungs you get the trend cough your bronchial tubes stay like 
coffee straws just close shut. So you get winded very quick. And especially if you're bigger and especially if you're out of shape because strength athletes don't do fucking cardio, bro, except you're going through, you know, a 45 minute sesh where you're just trying to get to those vinegar strokes at the end and you can't because you're getting a pump in your arms and then you keep losing it. And then your partner's like, Jesus Christ, wrap it up. It's not a good time. It's like a guaranteed way to spend more time jerking off, uh, making your partner uncomfortable with the amount of and the aggression of the sex, along with the inability to complete. Of course, that's not everybody, but it's a commonly enough cited side effect that it's showing up here, and I can attest to that. That was not a pleasant component of being on trend. Trend, like many other steroids, can also strain the liver, but it's typically not as harsh as some oral steroids because it's usually injected into muscles instead of being taken by mouth. It can cause kidney damage and FSGS, or focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, which is a condition where scarring occurs in parts of the kidney's filters. And the risk is heightened when a user has a genetic predisposition to FSGS already. Trend can also affect the heart. Research shows that steroids may contribute to the dangerously enlarged heart that some bodybuilders develop. We do think that you're at the upper limit of normal in terms of the wall thickness of your heart. That is most likely due to your weightlifting and your steroid use. Yeah. When the heart's pumping chamber, the left ventricle, gets too big and thick, it can't pump blood well. Although the muscle itself is larger, the actual space available for pumping blood is decreased and less compliant, resulting in reduced efficacy and a weakened heart. A weakened heart can lead to congestive heart failure, where blood backs up because the heart can't pump it out. And the heart slowly fills up and progressively stretches out, causing a host of other problems. Teenage boy, anywhere in this fucking world needs to be taking anabolic steroids. I mean, kids taking fucking trend, come on, man. You're gonna fuck yourself up. You can't fucking shag your bird. I second that too. And it's not just the unpleasant side effects or feeling bad. It's literally your psychology relationship with lifting weights to begin with, because there's no such thing as a free cookie. It's easy come, easy go. If you haven't checked out the interview with uh, Israel on Table Talk, he spent most of it talking about steroids and like a cautionary tale. The big thing is you can mitigate long-term negative health effects pretty well if you're intelligent, but that requires consolidating your use to a limited period of time and keeping it relatively low. If you're a teenager, giving teenagers something like anabolics is like giving a teenager access to the bunny ranch and telling them to be responsible. Inevitably, people take too much, they stay on for too long, they don't know how to train without it, they don't know how to feel okay without it, and in addition, they're dealing with all the sides. It's a bad fucking deal. At the very least, there needs to be a barrier for experience. It's like your first day at the rodeo, you don't just go fuck the bull. Like you have to be in long enough, not only to know what you're doing, but to be able to accurately weigh, am I actually invested in this thing as much as I thought to take this risk? Because people, when they're in that honeymoon stage with something new, always think they're in that. The number of people that starting to lift thought they were going to go far, who dropped out within two years, exponentially higher than people that just train long-term. So if you're getting into it in your first year and you think, no, no, man, I'm going to go the distance, you're full of shit. 95% chance that you're not. And you need to stick around long enough to make sure you know, this is what I love and I'm dead set on where I'm going and I know how this fits in. Because then that means you're training your diet, everything else is going to be on point and you're going to pay the fuck attention. So you're not going to fuck yourself up using this stuff that when you get stuck on it, can chew your shit up. Active trend is what's known as a <coughs> trend cough. The cough is often caused by something called pulmonary oil microembolism or POME. It's a common side effect of testosterone preparations that use oil for a longer lasting effect. Basically, when a foreign substance travels through the bloodstream into the body, it can block the main artery into the lungs or one of its offshoots. This can happen when you inject any oil-based substance and the reaction comes on fairly quick, usually within an hour. Your lungs man, start to be- Oh uh, man, I'm having flashbacks, man, all the drink cough. <laughs> this cough attack can be scary, but it may not be as dangerous as it seems, as a lot of bodybuilders report experiencing it and not suffering long-term effects. So the oil thing, I'm not really sure about. The theory was always that like if you nick a vein or something, because it with me, it happened maybe once every 10 or 12 times, it would happen right when you were injecting, like immediately to where like the needles in your leg and before you dump it, you're like starting to fight off the seizing. It's horrendous. Um, but the theory was that some oil would like get into a vein or something. And then that causes irritation that causes this spasming. It doesn't happen with other oil based stuff. I've never heard of somebody getting this from, it's called trend cough for a reason. So I don't know what the actual effect is, but usually it lasts for like a minute. And Guys, I'm not kidding. If you're not used to it, if nobody warned you about it, you think you're about to die. You think this is how they're gonna find me, on the toilet, needle in my leg, 
underwear around my feet. And really what it is, it's like an itch. It's like an irritation in your lungs. So intuitively you cough, but coughing makes it worse. So you realize that when you cough, you can't breathe as well. And then you cough again and it gets worse and worse and worse. And it clears up in a very short period of time. You're back to normal. It fucking sucks. It, word to the wise, the best thing you can do when you feel the burning, do everything in your power not to cough and it'll clear faster. Coughing makes it so much worse, but it's like it's like saying don't move when somebody's holding a lighter under your hand. Also, it fucks up your cardio for everything else. And strongman, that was a problem because God damn it, I would not do medleys by myself because there were times where I thought I was going to black out afterwards. It's like shit, to balance it out, I had to run like medication for asthma in order to keep my lungs clear so I could actually perform. And then you start stacking shit like that and you start to think like, what am I getting out of this that it merits all this fuckery? And that's where you realize you gotta, you gotta pull it back. One other thing before we move on to the brain. You're gonna sweat like crazy. I'm not sure anyone understands that. It's something to do with hypothalamus and triggering other effects on the Okay, the sweating is like the telltale sign. You see somebody with like red or purple skin and they're just like drenched, their opener's 500, but they're sitting on the bench with 135 at the powerlifting meet in a room that's air conditioned at 68 degrees and they're dripping fucking sweat. It's like, that's trend. I mean, guys, I never got it that bad, but I know guys, especially on heavy doses, especially if you're fucking fat, which was a lot of the heavyweights just trending themselves into oblivion they would wake up and their bed would be soaked in the middle of the night they wouldn't be able to sleep they get like insomnia but that was the funniest thing to me the little bit of time i spent uh in and around powerlifting meets because there were always those guys that were just fat as fuck trend out of their mind and it was like dude how do you survive life how do you do basic shit if the short time your heart rate's up to warm up for bench press which is like the lazy man's lift then like, how do you do anything at all? And that's very real. Between the breathing, the sweating, it's like your body is in its most inefficient possible state. As mentioned by my fellow content creator, More Plates, More Dates, some animal studies suggest that trend may increase the production of amyloid beta plaques in the brain, which are linked to Alzheimer's disease. However, it's unclear if the same effects occur in humans. Guys I've seen who cruise on trend, it seems like progressively something gets a bit off. <laughs> I think the guys that commit to taking medium high doses of trend year round start with something off. Side effect is aggression. So again, this is highly subjective and it's often determined on the baseline mental state and temperament of the individual in general. But when it comes down to trend, you're violent. A 2023 study conducted by Timothy M. Patowski et al. seemed to echo this sentiment as well. It notes that users displayed extreme propensity towards psychosocial harms in terms of aggression and violence and also impulsivity regulation issues. Participants claimed that it did make them more prone to snapping and that no other AAS acted on them in the same way as Trend did. It was the single most powerful contributor to psychological changes for them. I've done Chris and Matt, crap, all this, Coke, Stutter K, and Trend, I find, affected my mental health from the worst. Bro, I love Larry's candor. Like, between opening up about, like, porn addiction and stuff, and he's like, I've tried crack, man, I've done it all, and, I've, and Trend is, is horrible. Understand, you have to keep perspective. It hits everybody differently. It's an important thing to know. So some people don't feel the psychological effects. And if you do feel the effects, it's not like you're going to, turn into like some unhinged like psycho killer like the shit in cyberpunk like just going out and mowing down a bunch of cops but if you're somebody who's self-aware at all about your mindset and your state of mind and your thoughts it can be disturbing to pull back the screen and see what's behind there that's why i compare it to something you would give to soldiers because it is like like i use the term homicidal ideation it is like i'm walking around in like a video game there's like targets put on like objects that are blunt or sharp i'm like aware of the positions people are in if i would have to like attack them for like my own survival i could see how people have impulse control on it so snapping in real terms is probably what affects people the most is where they're short with their partners they get angry over something i'd get anxiety uh, i would dwell on small shit in my relationship that definitely puts strain on it i am i think a calm enough and even killed enough person to where it wasn't devastating it wasn't like i had to have an intervention but it's noticeable and the people who are with people who are going through that also notice it as well so ask yourself how much can your life really tolerate that extra strain now i fully believe if somebody does not have good regulation is not self-aware is just emotionally reactive or maybe psychologically they even respond more severely i could absolutely see people having really severe mental effects from it you got to take it with a grain of salt it doesn't mean everybody's gonna go nuts and end up in an asylum or beat their spouse but it is a shift in a direction towards a cliff 
that you do not want to fall off of. PEDs can cause muscles to grow too big for the tendons supporting them. Muscles so big, they're literally ripping the body apart. As Stuart Phillips, a muscle physiologist at McMaster University states, that's when you attempt some diabolically heavy lift and you just rip a bicep tendon or you rip a pectoralis muscle. There's all kinds of disgusting things that happen. This is what makes a drug like Tren, which is known for its dramatic size increasing ability, so dangerous. To avoid potential injury, some steroid users inject extra growth hormones to strengthen their connective tissue to strengthen the collagen and tendons and decrease fat. However, you can't pick and choose what growth hormones enlarge. This could result in overgrown bones in the face, hands and feet, and can also contribute to the enlarged heart we've already mentioned earlier. So it's not necessarily from the muscle growth because you can grow a muscle substantially and it not get that much stronger. What makes Trent so potent as a strength agent is its immediate effect on your nervous system because you get stronger on Trent Ace, which is quick, it's in and out super fast. Those effects are realized within like a few days in the gym. You feel a little snappier, a little more explosive, a little stronger. You might hit a rep PR or two, like that week. And those differences come about faster than you can physically add muscle tissue. The neurological changes are insane and that's tied into the aggression in your brain. So without even adding a bunch of mass, even if you're a guy that doesn't put on any mass, if you're a, a weight class competitor, I know some of those guys are using trend and through diet manipulation, keep their weight down you'll still rip shit off the bone. And that of course is what led to my injury. My bicep left by insertion point after 10 years of flipping tires because I was feeling strong. Somebody put, pulled a camera out. I decided to go hard for the gram and I went to flip the tire and it snapped off. Thankfully, that's only, I mean, I've had back injuries and other stuff. That's the only severe injury I got like that with an actual tendon rupture. Uh, and that's another reason I'll never go on trend again because I don't wanna have to walk around second guessing if I can structurally even support the weight I'm trying to lift. Uh, it does also limit your ability to repair and to grow uh, that connective tissue as well. So it's like more power, but also it's worsening your structure. I remember sitting in a hot tub with a former world's strongest man regular, somebody who's very well known from like, uh, we'll say maybe 2000s and early 2010s, who competed a lot and was notorious for getting injured all the fucking time. And we had a candid discussion about gear and they just started pointing to different parts. Um, this person competed more than everybody, but was always had a hamstring, a tear, a rupture, something holding the back. And he just started pointing. He was like, this was from a trend cycle. I was on wind straw here, stuff that dried you out stuff that was neurological made you too strong too quick and the trend is that as you talk the trend as you talk to people who are high performers especially in powerlifting where it's kind of the wild west or strength sports and you start to pick apart what they're taking what they're doing you're going to see a direct correlation the guys that ran certain compounds more aggressively are guys that had tendons just teleport away from their insertion point and that is not a key to longevity you can't get strong if you're not in one piece long enough to realize you're training uh, outcomes. It seems like a lot of people who take bodybuilding seriously do regular checkups and blood tests to make sure that their health is okay. I mean, if the goal is to have a sustainable career in this industry, they have to take care of themselves. For any of you who are dealing with an injury, you don't want to use bro science. You know, if you think it's small, it may not be. It may be bigger than it is. First piece of advice, always see a professional first. Get it scanned, get it checked out no matter how small. And given that steroids still require work, serious bodybuilders will understand hard work and being very regimented. In and this is the thing that is also why you tell people not to jump in early, pay your dues, get your stripes, because you have to prove you're a person who pays attention enough to do it the right way. Not only to get as much out of it, but to keep yourself in one piece. And there are two different camps. There's people that treat gear and orals like it's a fucking sampling line that sees candy. And there's people that are meticulous. There is no reason in 2024 not to get blood work, not to be aware of the markers you have to look for. There's no reason not to be responsible and to check. And the thing is how you handle your gear, it's probably how you handle your training and everything else. So if you're an idiot with your gear, there's probably massive gaps in your training and diet, which is another reason why you're probably gonna find yourself stuck where you're getting newbie gains. Again, Israel talked about this on the Table Talk podcast, and this coincides with everything I've ever known. You don't just get exponential growth for as long as you're training from steroids. You get a bump, then you hit homeostasis, and then you're back grinding away for these incremental little pissy bits of progress, but you're also loaded up with a bunch of toxic shit in the meantime. It's not a good spot to be in. So handle the basic stuff, be responsible. There's no reason not to have your health in check. Most people should be sidestepping this. The people who are mindful and responsible should be able to get the benefits without shortening their lifespan by a decade or more. Unfortunately, the, the kids in the gym, they hear in trend, holotustin, they go in the uh, black market and buy it, which is, is not real. Just like the idea driving bodybuilding as a sport, 
push beyond. And the thing is, as with many internet related things, the bodybuilding demographic is getting younger. Young people are exposed to so much online that they may not be otherwise exposed to in their regular life at their age, and they are easily influenced. These teens simply get influenced to look a certain way, a topic which we will soon dive into on this channel, looks maxing to go to the gym, right, and get bigger and stronger. It was because I wanted to become a man. And part of being a man is you have to be big. And a lot of young teens who are sometimes known to be impulsive are hearing that and turning to steroids. If you don't believe this is possible, and don't open your mouth about it. In this study, nearly all users said that more senior high school students are using steroids now than when they started. And that was in 1990, with just word of mouth and availability increasing it. Imagine how much more prevalent it must be now. According to the Australian National Drug Safety Household Survey of 2019, non-medical anabolic steroid use almost tripled in the 18 years between 2001 and 2019. There are reports that boys as young as 13 are asking about steroids. That's wild, if you ask me. But if this is the mentality, the literature suggests that once you bank up this kind of muscle tissue over the years, it's much easier to retain it indefinitely. The idea, grow in your prime, AKA when you're young, because the mechanism to build muscle gets worse and worse over time. So it kind of makes sense why young people are keen to get a head start, especially when, again, the internet is full of information and it's just a click away. And I do think guys like Derek from More Plates, More Dates know their stuff. But I'm just pointing out how easily influenced people are online, especially adolescents, and how easily misconstrued something someone says can be. Now that's universally true with everything, and I think it's a problem we have to face with social media at large. I don't know that we ever actually will. We're just going to be talking about it without actually having solutions. But um, anything that would have influenced a kid to do something reckless or destructive is going to be turned up to 11. And it, if that's what they're interested in, that's all they're going to see. They're wrapped in an echo chamber. When I started, I know I'm like, hey, back in my day, uh, we're talking about you know, around the year 2000, probably after high school, probably to like 2010, the the scene for lifting, it's like you'd be exposed to it. You'd see what the highest performers were, but it wasn't surrounding you every day. You didn't absorb it every day. Even now I'm like, wow, I'm spending a lot more time looking at freakish physiques coming out of the woodwork. And you have to have a mechanism to be able to battle that. Kids don't. They have to be taught how to take a step away, how to have perspective, how to not continuously seek instant gratification online by immersing themselves. And especially kids go psycho over things when they're involved in it. So I can absolutely see how it's influencing them. The question is, how do you give them the tools to cope? I don't know that there is one. Social media is a powerful thing. You know, it's all fun and games where they're, you know, in their teens, late teens, early 20s, with social media going all crazy. Ah! So you can see why steroids like Tren, which basically should translate to will make you big really fast, are so popular and growing increasingly more so in our modern world. I mean, you, you see the result very fast and you addict it for the result. However, is it worth it? To use a medication meant for bulking cows to bulk you just to be ripped? I understand the pressures that comes along with bodybuilding as a competitive sport, but in terms of the price of competition, health cannot be sacrificed because it is your health that keeps you there and allows for you to stay in the game. Am I going to choose that or some like random cattle drug that's shown to like inhibit deep sleep and cause like beta amyloid plaque buildup? We need to prioritize longevity, even in terms of having a sustainable career. Health comes first. Remember that the usage of trend isn't limited to bodybuilders. Just the bodybuilder using or no, no, the no, doctor no. People want a for... quick look, you know, you're going to the beach. So with the general public becoming increasingly fixated on their appearance, mm. drugs like these can be very appealing. I think the most powerful thing you can tell kids too is that their results are exponentially better if they fill out kind of their natural potential first. I started in my late 20s, I think I was like 27 when I went on my first uh, cycle and I was after 15 years, six years competing. I'd gotten to nationals. I'd got, I was over 600 pound deadlift. Uh, I was squatting on the order of 600 pounds. My press was strong and I was still growing, but I made a conscious decision because I wanted to take competition farther. I still did it like kind of an idiot and I'm still learning, but that's my history of training is taking the scenic route, which is why I'm here trying to keep you guys from suffering the same fate I did. But I was infinitely better off having gotten strong and built a base before going on. And that's the thing. You are sacrificing a lot of that. If you jump on quick, you will not understand how to train properly because you will not get punished for bad training decisions the same way. And that will affect you over the course of your entire training career. Whereas if you 
fill out. Then you go on, you can gain a lot in a very short period of time and be closer to that upper limit without having to blast insane amounts for the rest of your career because there's no point where like, okay, I've had enough. You get to your 30s. I'm getting into my 40s soon, next couple of years. And I can already see myself kicking the can. Like, oh, I'll wind down in my late 30s. I'll wind down in my mid 40s. Uh, maybe I'm 60. I'll go into a master's competition. And there's always a reason. You see strongmen in the master's division finding reasons to stay 40% body fat and eat their way into an early grade. Well, I got worlds coming up and they got a master's division now so I can eat like a performance athlete. Uh, and it's horrible. So long story short, a sustainable approach is going to involve making calculated risk, uh, doing the hard work first, delaying instant gratification, and understanding that these are tools that have very real trade-offs and must be done a certain way. And you have to establish if you're even smart enough, dedicated enough, uh, if you're going to be around long enough to do it the right way. So that's my take on that. Leave questions and comments below. Thanks so much for watching, guys. Let me know if you like this type of content. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.